understand these four steps, you need to know definition of step input, Laplace transform, uh, transfer function, and partial fractions, which by now hopefully all of you understand. But once you know these four things, you get y of t from the inverse transform basically right away. Okay, and what does this look like? Well, this part over here, you can write this as k minus k e to the power minus t by tau. So this one is a constant. So we know that there's some constant which is k. And let's look at this like this. Let's say t is infinity. If t is infinity, this value is going to be 0, right? So add infinity, it's going to get to k. We know that. That is asymptoting to k. We know that. And we know that this value is basically going down. At 0, this value is going to be uh, uh, is 1. So this is k minus k, so it's going to be 0. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to asymptotic to infinity. So asymptotic to k, and it's going to start at 0. It's going to look like that. And now we can see where are these values, and what are these values going to be. So let's just pick a value over here. Let's say the value of, of this is over here is t. Let's say the value is, uh, is uh, 2 tau for the sake of argument. Then this is going to be k times 1 minus e to the, so if it's 2 tau, this is going to be e to the minus 2, right? And so this is going to be 1 minus e square. If it's going to be 3 tau, then it's going to be 1, this is going to be 1 minus e to the minus 3, this is 1 minus e to the minus 2, and so on. So what's going on is that each power of e this is going to be 1 minus e to the minus 4, and so on. So each power of e corresponds to one time unit tau, right? So at each step tau, we're multiplying by a factor of 1 over e, okay? So it gets 2.74, sorry, 2.72 times less. This gap decreases by a factor of approximately 3 for each time step tau, okay? So it's 1 third, 1 ninth, 1 27th, and so on and so forth. And that comes with each time step tau, right? And that's why tau is a time constant. Okay, that's why the tau is a time constant because each time step tau results in this multiplication. And therefore, uh, we call tau the time constant. And we can basically see that at 5 tau approximately, okay, we're going to be at uh, 99 point, you can look, compute this up, 99.33% of final value. Okay, at five tau. So basically, at five times the inherent time constant, which is given over here, we can say the system has basically come to wherever it's going to get to. So if tau is, let's say, one millisecond, in five milliseconds, the mosquito has made its turn. If the time constant for a battleship is one hour, it takes five hours to for it to read. It's 99 percent. If you say turn right, it's going to take five hours to get there. Right. So that's roughly how we use it in the sort of engineering sense. We use five tau. Okay, or 3 tau if you want a little bit less. The other thing is that we gave a step input of 1 and the output asymptotes to k. So that's why it's called the gain parameter. So the input of 1 gets magnified by a factor of k. Okay. And that's what's going on. Now, in the homework, I said what happens if the input is not 1, but the input is 5? Well, we know that then the output is going to be 5k times whatever because it's a linear system, a base. Uh, superposition certainly obeys scaling, so the output is going to be just uh, over here 5k because it's linear. Okay, so it's very simple again. So I just wanted you to take a look at that. Uh, all right. So the last thing I want to say is that we have we can break this into two parts: this part over here and this part over here. So this one is also called the step response. Okay, uh, so yeah, so uh, not this. Oops, this is the step response. This one is the steady state response because that's what happens asymptotically, and this one is the transient response. This is what happens initially. Okay, and the transient response decays, and after about five tau, you can say it's basically gone kind of in the noise after that, we don't care. So we have always got, when we, when we kick something, like I'm going to kick this once again, okay, like this. So I'm going to keep it kicked, I guess, so maybe you should keep it like this, so, okay. So the vibrations are dying down, so I can say, oh, this has a time constant of approximately 0.2 seconds, okay. Because in about one second, the time went away, 
right? So maybe it's less than that, but that's, that's what's going on, right? The vibrations are the sound, okay? And I keep it kicked. Of course, in here, there is a, it's not linear, okay? Because if it were linear, when I kick it like this, it moves a certain velocity and it kind of stays there, but of course, the wall is blocking it. So it's a non-linear system, but we can approximately make it linear for some short period of time before it hits the wall. And, you know, we can say, but, but, we, but basically you can essentially hit a system with a spike, keep it go, or not a spike, with a, with a step input and see what the response is and that will tell you the time constant, okay? And, and that's one reason why when you buy a car, they say, you know, you should never kick the tires, it sounds crazy. No, you should kick the tires. Actually, you should press down in the front and let go. If you have a, if you have a car or if your friend has a car, just press down in the front and let go and what you'll see is you'll see the time constant. You'll see how long it takes for it to get back to steady state again and if you take one-fifth of that, that's the time constant, roughly. Okay, so you can say, assuming it's a first order system, which actually it turns out to be a shock absorber is more or less a first order system actually. Because you take an input and it, it'll take, it, 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 for the, you can, you can, you can uh, uh, model it as that anyway. Okay, any questions about first order system? Because it's going to get a bit messier with second order. Before I go there, I want to, I want to uh, get this. Any questions about I'll talk about final value when you do the, uh, uh, the final value here is actually straightforward. The way, the final value theorem, uh, the final value theorem states that, uh, so the final value theorem states that the uh, limit t tends to infinity, t tends to infinity uh, x of t is equal to limit s tends to zero s x s. Okay, it's a very useful theorem to have. Okay, you take s x s, multiply the Laplace by s, take the limit s tends to zero. That's what happens over here. So in this case, the uh, the uh, the uh, this is what we have over here, right? So s times y s. Okay, we want to know the limit is going to be. Uh, let's just write it over here. So it's k over s plus k tau by 1 plus tau s. So you multiply that by s, so this goes away, and this becomes s k tau by 1 plus tau s. When you set s to 0, this basically becomes 0, and we say the final value is k, which is exactly what we see. It goes to k, right? So that's what we'll use uh, elsewhere. Here it's trivial, so it's not even worth doing, okay? So any questions about this? So it just comes straight out from the final value. If you have a system where you have some energy storage and dissipation and then the possibility of storing again, then we get a second order system. And I'll tell you, uh, the easiest second order system to understand intuitively is, is a guitar string, okay? And as I told you, these strings and, you know, have, it's a very tight relationship between harmonics and, and math, okay? Going back to Pythagoras, but let's not get distracted. So I take a string, which is nominally in this position at time zero, and then I pluck it at time zero. So at time zero, I pluck it, okay, which you can think of as being a, a delta input. It's not a step input, but nevertheless, it'll suffice. So as we pluck it, what happens is that the string gets distorted and it lengthens, and when it lengthens, what's happening is that it's storing potential energy, just like a spring in compression, a, stri a, 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 a spring in compression or, or a string, a taut string that's been pulled away from its median position, uh, middle position is going to have energy stored in it. So when you let go, what happens is it's going to move into kinetic energy, but it's going to overshoot it and go to the other side, okay? When it goes to the other side, what happens is that the energy that was, uh, it's not fully dissipated yet. The energy is, 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 going, to be, is going to be converted into uh, potential energy and it's going to go to the other side. And when it reaches this maximum, just like a swing, you push it, it goes to the center point, it's just at velocity, it goes to the other side, okay? At that point, it's going to uh, reach the peak of its potential energy and come back, okay? And it's just like a swing going back and forth. This system is going to go back and forth, okay? Oscillate back and forth. And at some, what happens eventually, of course, is that the, the, the forces of friction come into play and it relaxes back over here. And so what we will see, if you look at the, if you look at some point over here, we will see that that point will actually, in the beginning, is going to be like this, and it's going to go like that. It's going to be uh, exponentially uh, declining sinusoidal, okay? And if there's no friction, 
then it's going to vibrate forever. Okay, it's going to vibrate forever uh, with the same sinusoid. Okay, so this intuitive uh, picture can actually be derived from just the math of the system, and it's going to, going to show you. And it's actually beautiful how all of this can be derived from just a few simple equations for a second order system. So this is what you have to have intuitively, and the math then becomes really, really simple. And so for a second order system, G of S is going to be given by K over, I'm gonna write in a slightly different form than it's in the text, S over A square plus two S over A, uh, sorry, ah, I knew I was gonna make a mistake here. So S over uh, omega square plus 2A S over omega plus 1. Okay, and in the text I'm using uh, eta, oops, that's why I'm writing A instead of eta because I can't write eta. I can type eta but I can't write it. So I'm going to use A instead of eta. Let's see, eta is uh, something like that. Okay, just because I don't know how to write eta. <laughs> it's Greek to me, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, it looks a bit complicated, but it's not that complicated. If you look at S over omega, it's something like a quadratic in S over omega, right? It's like x squared plus 2ax plus one, where x is S over omega, right? And in, in the text, I'm using omega n is equal to omega. I, just want, I don't want to keep writing n. So we have different terms, so omega, is called, oh, I have my color chalks here, so good, so let's do this. So this one, omega, is called the natural, uh, uh, natural frequency. And uh, A, or eta, is called the dampening, uh, damp damping ratio, sorry. Okay, and K is the gain, as before. So you look at it and say, boy, this looks pretty obscure, but by the time class ends, hopefully you'll have a pretty good appreciation of what's going on, uh, why these are called uh, these things. And the way to understand it is to just quickly uh, look at a simple case. Let's look at a system where A equals zero, and this is what's called an undamped system. undamped because A is zero, then we know that the, uh, and we're looking at the step response. We're looking at all, in all cases, we're looking at the step response. For the step response, what we're going to do is that we say Y of S is going to be one over S multiplied by K over S over A square plus two uh, sorry, S over omega squared plus 2A S over omega plus one. So if A equals zero, this term is going away. So that goes away and then we can write this as, uh, we can just take omega to the numerator, this becomes omega squared over S squared plus omega squared. Okay, that's just a simple transformation. And then this using partial fractions can be written as K times one over S minus omega square over S square plus omega square. And this, now the, 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 in, in, the inverse transform of K over S, so remember it's a Laplace, so it's linear, so we can do the inverse one by one. So inverse transform of this is just going to be uh, K, and then this one is going to be minus K cos omega t, okay? And that's, that's it, so K cos omega t. So, uh, so what, what, what is this over here? That's a, sinus, that's a sinusoidal oscillation. And, with, you know, so you have some K minus this, so this is like a constant, you know, and from that constant you're subtracting uh, cos omega t, and this, turns out to be a figure that's missing, but it's basically nothing more than, uh, than a, an oscillation, I think that goes like this, where the height is going to be K, because K 
cos omega t, the maximum value is going to be 0. Uh, sorry, the, it can go to 0. When this is 0, the height is going to be k. When this, height, when this, this is 1, it's going to be 0, right? So it's just sort of the complement of the sinusoidal. So that's going to look like that, more or less. And so it's going to go to minus, uh, sorry, it's going to, no, it goes, it doesn't go to, uh, it goes to zero, right, k minus k. So it, actually it's, let me redraw it over here. It's going to go, it's going to sinusoidal, it's, it's going to be t, this is k, and it kind of k over two is the midpoint. And uh, I guess it's going to, so at, at zero, uh, t is zero, cos omega t is one, so it's going to be zero, so it's going to go like this. Okay, that's your oscillating. And so this is an oscillating system. It's an oscillating system with a magnitude, with a gain k. So we see that the gain is k, that's the height. The natural frequency is going to be what? Cos omega t. That's the frequency with which the string is oscillating. And the damping ratio is zero, it's not, un it's not damped. Okay, we'll see what damping means in a minute. It's not damped. And so what we're saying is if I pluck a string and it's undamped, it's going to oscillate forever, okay? because there's no energy dissipation in the system. It's completely friction free. And so this is exactly what we get with a string. Or if you take a, a swing rather than a string, okay, you have, <laughs> in, in, interestingly enough, this, a string, a swing, and a spring are all three oscillatory systems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just discovered that. This is great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so string, swing, spring, are all uh, harmonic systems. They all are second order systems. They all have energy storage in them and they all look like this. And when A, A, when A is zero, they all look like that. And they all oscillate at their natural, natural harmonic. And it will, it will turn out when you model a system that this omega is corresponds to sort of the tension in the spring. Okay, in, in a string, it's a tension, so you ten, make a string more tense in a violin or in a, or, or in a cello, it's going to vibrate differently. If you have a swing, it depends on the length of the, of the swing. And if it's a spring, it, it's how tightly it's coiled and what material it's made of, okay? So the spring constant is basically related to the natural frequency of the spring uh, in this case. So, great, spring, string, swing, okay. <laughs> I have to put that in the book somewhere. Yes? I'm not sure, like, the partial fractions are, are correct. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Well, uh, <laughs> let's see. It's be s squared plus omega square minus s omega, s minus s omega square over s times. Uh, so what do I have over here? So I want k omega square on top. Uh, why do I have this as a partial fraction? Okay. So I've clearly messed up something, but I did do it when I wrote it. Uh, square minus yeah, it's going to be s omega square, isn't it? So I want k. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, that's, that's right, yeah, cos is S anyway, it's sine is omega squared, square. you're right, it should be S over, okay, that's going to work, sorry, I screwed it up, okay, yeah, so this should be S, thanks Raymond, okay, yeah, so that will work, right, because here we get S square, and then S squared plus omega squared minus S squared. So that's what you get, okay. So, and anyway, this is cos. If you put omega squared on top, that would be sine. Okay. Uh, let's look at another system where we have uh, zeros less than A less than one. And we call this an under damp system. And it looks, in a minute, we'll see what we will know what it is. So let's just look at this case. And we just say Ys is equal to K over, this is the same thing, S, over, so I'm just going to do this same transformation of putting a multiplying by omega just to save a bit of time. So here's k omega square over s by s square plus 2as plus omega square. And the partial fraction of this turns out to be k over 1 over s minus uh, s plus a omega over uh, s plus a omega square plus uh, omega d square, but the, we introduce a new term omega d minus a omega over s plus 
a omega square plus omega d square, where I've defined omega d square equals omega square 1 minus a square. Okay, so uh, you can work out the, the math if you want, but this is, this is done by doing what's called completing the square, and I'm not going to go into that, but you can try it out. Um, if you do this, then the, the uh, inverse transform is given by yt equals k uh, 1 minus e to the a omega t. Oops. So the 1 comes from the 1 over s. This one is actually in the form s plus a omega a over a plus omega square. So it turns out to be uh, e, uh, into, let me just write this down, cos omega dt plus a over square root 1 minus a square sine omega dt. Okay, so we have over here basically uh, uh, the, the exponentially modulated cos plus some factor over here. And the next step in the text is sort of obscure, so I'm going to explain what I did. <laughs> okay, and you, uh, I would, maybe you can go back and take a look. All I'm really doing is saying that uh, I, want to, uh, I, want to, I want to use this formula sine a plus b equals sine a cos b plus cos a sine b. Okay, that's a standard trigonometric identity. So I have over here cos something sine something, okay? So what I want to do is I want to basically get in the sine a cos b cos a sine b. And the way I do that is that I take square root 1 over a square outside like this, square root 1 over minus a square like this. And then I have a times sine omega dt, like that. And over here, I have to multiply this by square root of 1 minus a square, right? Does everybody see that? So all I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm taking out 1 minus a square, and I'm basically multiplying 1 minus a square, and then in the inside. So I get this. And then all I do is basically I substitute a equals uh, sine theta, sorry. Uh, a equals cos theta, some value theta. Why can I do that? Because 0 is less than a less than 1. Since it's a value less than 1, it must be, it can be expressed in the form cos theta. Okay, I can't do it otherwise. I can only do it because it's in this range. If a is cos theta, then square root of 1 minus a square is sine theta, right? And a is cos theta, so I get this form cos omega dt sine theta, and this is going to be cos theta, okay? Because square root of 1 minus a squared is square root of 1 minus sine squared. Uh, cos squared theta is sine squared theta, and so I get sine theta. And then this is cos omega dt sine theta, cos theta sine omega dt. And using this identity, I can just rewrite this as sine of theta plus omega dt. Okay, and uh, theta is given by basically cos inverse of A, okay, or it turns out to be the same as tan inverse of uh, 1 minus A square root 1 minus A square by A is A, but this actually is a better form, so I'm going to fix this in the, in the text to write cos inverse because that's easier to understand. But this is what you get, right? So let's look at this more carefully. What we have here is some gain K, okay, so that's fine, and then we're going to uh, asymptotically reach k because this exponentially decreasing value with time. So eventually you'll get to k, so that's the asymptote, we know that. Then over here we have some function of time, omega d, right? And theta is going to be just a uh, constant because a is cos theta, so a is a constant, so this is a constant. Theta is cos inverse a is some constant. So I can sort of view that as being some kind of offset depending on the value of a. And then we have over here e to the minus a omega t. So the larger a is, the faster this goes down, okay? The larger the value of a, because it's zero is less than a less than one, the faster it declines, okay? 
So we can now start sketching this out, something like this. So we have a curve where eventually we're going to get to k. So this is k over here. At time 0, there's going to be 0 because when time is, you can actually just see that when it's 0, uh, this whole thing is going to basically become 1 because e to the minus 1 and that's 0. is e to the minus 0 is 1, so it's 1 minus 1 at 0. So at time 0, it's 0. And then what happens is that you get essentially a family of curves which are all going to eventually converge like this. That's one curve like that. And I can show you another curve like that. Actually, they're all, yeah. And you know, each of them is, is OK. Uh, so the initial part is rising up. And then we're exponentially decreasing the, the uh, D d variation because this has a magnitude of 1 and as time goes on this is exponentially going down to 0 so 0 multiplied by uh, 1 multiplied by 0 is 0 so the oscillations are going away and we're just left with k okay and the greater the value of a the faster it goes down okay F greater meaning closer it is to 1 so if a is if, if it's very small so this one is going to be essentially a small value of eta a, so let's say a equals 0 0.2, and then as a becomes larger, let's say a equals 0 0.4, and then so on, so a equals 0 0.9, okay, of course all this be within less than 1, it gets fast, it gets, and, and then in the, in the like 0.95, as I've shown over here, it kind of goes almost here and then like this, okay. So we get a family of curves. An illustrative thing to do is to use GNU plot and put this in and just play with it, give different values of a and theta. It's very easy to do a new plot and to see what happens. It's really quite interesting to see how this, this behaves. And in this case, what we have now to go back into the time domain, so the intuition is that a controls essentially how loose the system is. Okay, if A is 0 0.2, it's kind of a loose system, okay? So when A is zero, we're oscillating forever, right? We put A 0.2, what happens is that it's a bit tighter, okay? And when it's a bit tighter, what happens is you, you, you hit it with a step, it goes up very fast, okay? And then too much energy gets accumulated, it goes down, but it's still a bit loose, so it's going to come back down and kind of settle down, wobble a little bit. It's like jelly, right? You poke a bit of jelly, it shakes a little bit, and then eventually stops, right? Of course, you're giving it a step input, not an impulse input, but same thing applies for step input as well. In the case when, e, when A gets closer and closer to 1, it gets tighter and tighter, okay? It takes a bit longer to get to the final value, uh, but but when it gets there, it pretty much stays there. It doesn't vibrate too much, okay? And so, uh, again, uh, if you've been in a car with a loose suspension, this is, would be a slow damping constant. So when there's a bump in the road, you kind of go down and then it you know, kind of wobbles like that. On the other hand, if you have a tight suspension, you, you, you go up. Uh, actually, yeah, so it, it, it takes a bit longer to get to the... It's not exactly the same, but it takes a bit longer to get there. Once it gets there, it gets, it gets, more, or it gets more stable. Car suspension, I guess, is not the right example to use because there, if it's tight, it, 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 uh, uh, it uh, gets there sooner, actually, rather than later. But this is a system where you are approaching the asymptote a bit slower. And so we can view this as being sort of the responsiveness. And this we can view as a stability. And in a second order system, we have a trade-off between responsiveness and stability. If the system is responsive, so a small shock, it responds right away, then it's going to be oscillating. Whereas if we have less responsiveness, it gets stable. So this is a system where you know we, we don't feel the we don't feel the effect, but then it, 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 it takes longer for it to get to its asymptotic value. That's the characteristic of a second order system over here. So this is trade-off between stability and responsiveness, which I kind of started out by saying, and here we can sort of see it mathematically. Okay. So so we sort of have to choose between okay, I'll respond quickly, but then I'm going to be taking a while to get to my final value, or I'm going to take my time responding, I'll get there slowly, okay? And I'll give an example of this 
more clearly when we do uh, uh, feedback control system in a computer network. We'll see exactly what this means in a computer network setting. Uh, but uh, this is basically showing, and this comes straight out of this over here. So I've kind of rushed through the math a little bit, but uh, I you know, suggest you go back and take a look. Uh, all you need to do is to remember that if you just do this substitution, the cos plus sine form becomes just a sine form over here. Yeah. So does A give idea on both the stability and responsiveness? Yes, it does. So we, the, the damping factor, which is A, uh, tells us that if A is closer to zero, then it's very responsive. Okay? With step input, you respond right away. But it's going to be taking a while to settle down. Whereas if A is closer to one, then it takes a while to get there. But when it gets there, it doesn't oscillate too much. Okay. That's the, uh, yeah. OK, now the, the way we get damping factor in a string is to put little uh, weights on it. Right? So if you've if you ever seen anybody with a guitar or a violin, they have these little weights that they can put on the string. And by putting those weights, so now <laughs> maybe you can tell us about it. Those little weights allow you to control the responsiveness. Right? So if you put the weights on it, you actually change the natural frequency and you change the responsiveness of those. Uh, Right. Okay. Right. Right. And the tension remains the same. So natural frequency remains the same, but then you can make it responsive or stable depending on where you put the put those little beads, I guess. Okay. So there's a natural thing over here. Okay. So the case where A is equal to one is what's called a critically damped system, and it's a system which is. Uh, uh, it's sort of the ideal. We really like it. Okay, and how do we find out what happens? So when A is equal to one, so it's called critically damped. So again, what happens is that let's just look at the equation over here. So it's one over S times. Uh, we just look at k omega square over. Um, OK, so actually, I shouldn't have erased the previous one. Because uh, let me just write down the yt. And then we'll just set uh, a equals 1. So uh, when we have yt equals k times 1 minus e to the minus a t, uh, sorry, a omega t over square root of 1 minus a square, and then going to be sine of omega d t uh, plus it's going to be actually cos inverse of uh, cos inverse of a. Okay, So we're setting a to 1. If you set a to 1, this one is, uh, <laughs> this one is not good because it's going to be uh, <laughs> divided by 0. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to try the different form. This is the wrong form for me to look at because I'm actually going to get 0 by 0 form. Not good. Let's try again. k times, uh, we'll use the other form, 1 minus e to the minus uh, a omega t cos omega dt plus Why am I getting the one over one minus square root? Uh, okay, this is this is. I guess I should do the okay. Uh, yeah, I I don't like this. <laughs> what I need to do here actually is to use a partial fraction expansion. Okay, uh, I'm saved by the bell, as they say. So let's continue with the. Uh, critically damped system uh, in, in, in Monday because I, uh, I don't like this. Okay. Bye.